What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of inspiredinsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs, leaders, authors, the founders, some you've heard of, some you've never heard of. And, you know, I have today uh, Mike Michalowicz, I'm going to introduce in a second. But um, if you have not checked out any of his work, his books, you need to. I mean, absolutely need to. If you've heard titles like Profit First, Pumpkin Plan, all of those, you can see them behind him, by the way, if you're watching the video. Yeah, strategically, Rock right? work, that is perfect. Um, you need to check it out. Um, I've listened to every single one of them on Audible, some of them more than once. Um, but the if you check out InspiredInsider.com, I love hearing the challenge stories. And Mike gives the real deal in the trenches. He doesn't hold back on some of the big challenges and mistakes. And with this journey, that's what happens. And so uh, you can listen to the Pipe Drive co-founder, uh, Ermas. He talks about brain surgery, getting married, moving to from Estonia to the US all in one year. It was a tough year. Um, for him. And um, they had at the time, like 10,000 customers. And I was looking it up the other day. Now they over have a, over 100,000 customers. Holy uh, and so they've been growing and doing amazing, but it's not without its big challenges. Um, so check out that and many more on inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. You know, we help um, businesses connect to their best relationships or Dream 100 through running their podcast. Um, I've seen no better way in giving, Mike, to people, uh, giving to my relationships and putting on my platform and touting whatever they're working on through the podcast. And it's not just about business, it's about leaving a legacy. And, and Mike does talk about in his book, F Fix This Next, about legacy. And I consider, Mike, when I have you on, having you leave a legacy more than what you're doing and mm -hmm. me leave a legacy more of what we're doing too. So if you have questions about podcasts, we've been doing it for over 10 years, if you can believe it, um, to rise25.com. Uh, today's guest, like I said, uh, Mike McCallowitz, he's the author of Profit First, Clockwork Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, my favorite title, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. <laughs> and if you listen to any of his audibles, I consider, don't read them, listen to them because Mike has yeah. a sense of humor. And, and he adds in some ad libs and you just get that sense of humor when you listen to him read the books um, rather than, I mean, you could read it, but I love the audible part. And of course, fix this next, make the vital change that will level up your business. Um, and by his 35th birthday, Mike had founded and sold two companies, one to private equity, another to a Fortune 500. Today he's running his third, you know, big venture, which is Profit First Professionals. Mike, thanks for joining me. Jeremy, thanks. Or should I say Dr. J? That's actually better. Dr. J. I'll take Dr. J. You can call me Jeremy yeah. too. Um, thanks, thanks for having me. Yeah, totally. And I mean that. And I, was, I think about your book on a weekly basis, your books on a weekly basis. I was, you know, planting tomatoes with the family and what makes me think of pumpkin plant. And I ripped off some of those stems on nice. the tomato plant, not just in business, but, you know, so I want to talk about how the fix this next came about, but just talk I always think about that pumpkin plan methodology. Just talk yeah. for a second about that because I think it's really core to a business. I, I know in the beginning of this book, you're like, where, people are like, what book do I start with? And yeah. I, my opinion is actually the pumpkin plan because of that methodology. So, talk, yeah. I mean, my opinion may be different from yours, which you get priority because it's your books. But Well, no, yeah. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. I, I think... Um, I think ultimately we have to know what our biggest challenge is and address yeah. that. I, I, uh, with the pumpkin plan, it's, it's based upon biomimicry, something I, I, I'm just fascinated by. It's basically, if we have a problem, instead of trying to just find a solution, why don't we find the answers that already exists and nature, you know, mama nature has spent a lot of time kind of resolving some issues. So maybe she knows something. And in the case of the pumpkin plan, I discovered how pumpkin farmers were using the growing process that nature's developed to grow pumpkins, but to extraordinary size, healthily, organically, rapidly. And uh, one of the elements you, and you're doing with your tomato plants is remove the, st the, the uh, growth of, of the, the stunted tomatoes or pumpkins, R remove the, the dying vines. Uh, don't try to grow as much as possible. Try to grow the select few. 
it's interesting in in pumpkin farming, uh, tomato farming, all, all kinds of farming. Most of those people are in the quantity game, so any growth is good growth. But a select few go after this colossal growth, and they do it by selectivity. That's what I found happens in entrepreneurship. Most entrepreneurs are in the quantity game. I need more customers, and they don't grow. The the select few are saying, I need the right customers and I need to clone them. So that's what the pumpkin plan is about, how to pick them, how to protect them, and how, mm-hmm. to, how to actually remove the distractions. Yeah, and you're right. It depends where people are at. And maybe I just need to hear the message over and over because I'm more ADD than most of don't go after the shiny objects and focus in on what is really driving the business. So yeah. maybe that's the message I need to hear, Mike. So not for everyone, but um, fix this next. Okay, I always wondered, in a, you know, how do you come up with the next book? When, when is it right to do the next book? And you said this one was interesting, how this one came about. Yeah, this one was unexpected, Dr. J. I, mm-hmm. um, so I, I sent out an email. It takes me about five years to write a book. And uh, I, I do write a book or produce a book every year. So people are like, how can it take five years and you turn out a book every year or two? Well, I, I write three or four simultaneously. So there's a research phase, there's testing. So I'm writing three books right now. There is one slated for 2021. And um, so I emailed my, my readership five years ago and said, what is the biggest challenge you're facing this year? Because there's a lot of clarity in those surveys. You get 1,000 or 2,000 responses and you see a consistency. That's probably something I should pursue. Well, I'm not the most technically savvy guy. I, 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 I don't know why I did, but I, I clicked the same button multiple times to send it, I guess, because the same email went out three times that day. But what was fascinating is in certain cases, the same person answered the same question for their biggest challenge of the year multiple times that day with different answers. Wow. So this one guy's like in the morning, he's like, I got sales <laughs> Do problem. you think they're like, just like joking with you at that time? You're like, yeah, they're just playing. Uh, maybe, but it yeah. happened with enough mm. sophisticated joke. Uh, but, uh, but I think not because they answered enough times with enough specificity. Mm. Clearly there was thought about it in the moment. So in the morning, guys, like the biggest challenge is here we have sales. In the afternoon, it's like, we have hiring issues. Actually, our goal for this year is hiring. And you can just see this person iterating through mm. not knowing what their challenge is. And that's when it became clear the thesis of Fix This Next was this. The biggest challenge business owners face is knowing what their biggest challenge is. Mm. That's the biggest challenge we have. And without that clarity, we get st- stuck in this kind of, we're mired in this, in this circle of just doing the same thing over and over, putting out fires after fires. And uh, you know, we come in with a vision for the day a plan for the year. And uh, it's, it's more dictated by our email and the question outside, lined up outside the door than it is by our vision. So how do we know what the biggest challenge of the business is? That's became the thesis of the book, find it and resolve it. Mike, can you give me an example of one person and what they said as far as how they figured out what that challenge is, the biggest challenge is? Because like you said, there's a lot of things firing at us on a daily basis. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, they're even coming in now. I, I got a call from, this has happened two days ago. There's a hot air balloon company. Mm. And they thought their biggest challenge was, um, was sales because of the COVID crisis going on. So if no one's buying their stuff. So it was, how do we get more customers? So within, there's five levels in the Fix This Next model. It's called the business hierarchy of needs. Within them, there's five needs. There's 25 core needs that make up the DNA of a business. Like it's, it's inevitably one of these questions. And uh, he said it was client conversions. Like how do we get people on these hot air balloons when you can't gather? So they were thinking, they were making these dividers, these plastic dividers. So you can go up and everyone has like a little corner of the hot air balloon, but, but people like to walk around to see the different views and really struggling. So we had a call and he went through the analysis and he, he realized he didn't have a conversion problem he had a prospecting problem, meaning the type of customer he's trying to attract was no longer attracted. People don't want to gather. It's not convincing them or saying an environment for them. They just don't want to do it in the first place to be stuck in the basket with 15 strangers. <laughs> so he realized he needs to find a new prospect. Well, the new prospect is advertising. Actually, he's, he's actually working on it now. Hot air balloons, um, there are some um, aviation regulations, but they're allowed to carry massive banners kind of like if you're at the beach and you see one of those airplanes pulling a banner behind it 
think of that banner, but like 20 times yeah. bigger. Yeah. Let's get married banner. or marry me or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they can, yeah, exactly. They can lift these massive banners up and float uh, in areas near cities or towns. And he's like, oh my gosh, I might be going after the wrong prospect. So by going through this model, he was forced to consider what he wasn't considering. The default response is, something's not working. How am I going to make it work? And we just kind of push that round peg through a square hole or square peg through a round hole. What the fix this next mile forced him to do was get the empirical data. And he saw very clearly, there's just not prospect flow anymore. So how do I get new prospect flow? And it wasn't the game, the same people as getting different people. Mm, just changing the customer. Changing the customer, which, which, which re, to, to get that and level, the he had to change the question. He had to change yeah. the question. Yeah. You know, I like to talk about some of the companies and people that influence this book and um, there's, and we'll talk about some of the stories, but specifically the most important person, which is your wife. Um, you know, you tell some interesting stories about kind of, Mike, you were made for this and Mike, you need to get a job. Yeah. Talk sure. about the two contrasting pieces there. <laughs> yeah. So um, in, you know, genius of all geniuses here, I, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. Um, 12 years ago, I, I make a commitment. I have an epiphany for myself that I need to become an author. I, I'm going to be a full-time author. And entrepreneurial endeavors subsequently have come out of it, but I'm going to write about entrepreneurship. Why is that? What, why, why were you thinking that? Because I, uh, I, as an entrepreneur, I, even though I had sold two companies, I, I actually had built and sold two tech companies, one to Fortune 500, one was private equity. I never ran those profitably. And I started a third company where I lost all the money I made selling my prior two companies. I didn't understand the essence of what made entrepreneurship work. And we actually went through depression, struggled with, with entrepreneurship. And I realized I actually need to learn how to be a, an effective entrepreneur. So I started writing for myself and I said, oh my gosh, what I mm. discovered for myself is what I got to share with other entrepreneurs. Mm. I got to write about this stuff. I actually have the original book, which was a jur journal, which is a guy's term for diary. <laughs> <laughs> I still have it. It was a diary and um, realized I, I got to write. So I went to my wife. I said, I, I got to be an author. I, I mm. need to write this. And um, she didn't really get it. Uh, and you know, she's like, oh, here's one of Mike's ideas. Um, but I got an email that came in from someone who read, not a book I'd written because I hadn't written a book at that point, but an article and said, this has changed my life. This mm. is effective. And I showed my wife and my wife read through it once and she stopped and she read it through again really slowly. And she says, Mike, you're born for this. Mm. She could tell from that guy's words, like that was it. And I felt, you know, when your, your best friend, your soulmate affirms your dream, it's like, yes, I felt so energized that day. Well, fast forward six months later, maybe, maybe it was a year later. Um, the author journey is, is like any other entrepreneurial journey. It's effing hard. There's a lot of competition. You might not make it. You got to stick to it. Well, you know, my, my first launch day, my first book was The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. The very first day, I had no idea how to launch a book. Zero books sold, which just have clarity on the pain of that. That means my own mother didn't buy a book that day. Zero. And, uh, you know, and the income coming home represented. And, and in the book, Mike, you talk about how many copies you had in your garage. Oh, I and think I had 20,000. I think it was 20,000 right. copies. So it's not like, like oh, too bad. It wasn't like a made on demand. It was like you had real physical Old school books printing. Stacked up. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I got a week supply here. This will last me a week. I thought <laughs> <laughs> it, lasted, uh, it lasted 10 years. Um, it's gone. And it's all gone now, except for uh, there's a couple copies that I'm saving just as uh, a memento. But my yeah. wife then at that point sat me down and says, Mike, you got to get a real job, which for an entrepreneur, that is a knife to the heart, you know, to get a real job. That's devastating. And it devastated me to hear that, but it was the truth. It was the God's truth. Um, I couldn't do it. I, do I actually doubled down on authorship. I said, no, no, I got to make this work. And I did. You know, that's what I love about it. And uh, we, I could feel that when I read, when I listened to that. Um, and you know, the, the other story I love from the book, and you talk about this, is um, Savannah Banana. Oh, yeah. So, uh, the Savannah Bananas is, a, is just a remarkable story. I, I started writing about them in Profit First. I, ever since I discovered them, they, just, they more discovered me and, and kind of waved their hands. I was like, oh, my God, these, these people are remarkable. They, um, they challenged the notion 
of an industry as opposed to this challenge the notion of what's not working for them. They said, what's not working for our industry? So they went through this fix this next process. And the idea is there's always different elements playing out in a business, but at any given time, there can only be one element that's the most important element. You know, that's the definition of most. So what needs to be fixed next? And once you fix it, it's kind of like whack-a-mole. Then you find the next fix and you find the next. Well, they, they just challenged the notion of, uh, of baseball. And they said, uh, they said, baseball is kind of boring. This is a baseball team owner saying this. He goes, baseball is kind of boring. And so they, they amplified entertainment. Going to a Savannah Bananas baseball game is, is like going to a Harlem Globetrotters basketball game just on steroids. You know, now you have 5,000 people in the audience. It's massive. And this, this is a minor league team. Uh, they've sold out uh, three consecutive seasons. Um, this season, they are doing a full about face because of the COVID crisis. The season started in May. Um, they have the, it's a whole new animal, and they're still profitable. They're still selling tickets. Baseball is supposed to be done, and they're growing. But what was fascinating and what I put in their story was the day came, they realized they were stuck in the confines of their stadium. Their stadium can fit legally 4,500. They squeeze in 5,000. You know, you're, you, people are out in the outskirts of the field and on the hill and so forth. And uh, they said, how do we deliver this to everybody? And when they started asking that question, because the next fix was not doing better entertainment. It was actually allowing more fans to see. That's what they identified through this analysis. Him like a ton of bricks. He, Jesse, the owner, once he had clarity on what he needed, the answer was always sitting in front of them. There was a stack of these letters he always was getting from people inquiring about it. And he went through it. There was a letter from the company owned by Ron Howard, you know, like the famous movie guy, yeah. um, saying we want to consider making a TV show about the Savannah Bananas. And uh, mm. he responded to it. They sent down a producer for the final two games of the last season. So this was 20. 19 and uh of the 10,000 or so concepts pitched to ron howard and their team the number one uh, accepted kind of concept for a pilot tv show was the savannah bananas and the antics that go on there it's still playing out and with the covid crisis things have have shifted but we'll we'll see in the next six months to a year does this become a tv show but what was so interesting is he busted through the confines of a wall a stadium and now he has potential to entertain and serve you know, millions of people. Yeah. And, and um, people should check, you know, actually, actually listen to a read fix this next. You talk about how they, not only the TV show, but also different products that can live oh, on yeah. beyond what that experience is. Right. Right. Beer, Savannah banana beer. It goes out like crazy. Hey, you know, what? that was, was a like shift the- for me, a mindset shift, because it's like, how do you touch people and go beyond even what your service, your core services to yeah. other services? So we, we yeah. were well, you know, they built, they built fans. I, I went to now three games there. It's a must attend experience. And I remember going to the first game. I was just, I was so taken aback by the entertainment and how circus like it was, but in such a fun, engaging way that um, at the end of the game, I, I didn't know what team won because they actually play, play a baseball <laughs> game. So at the end, I, I see one guy, he's wearing all the gear. He had a Savannah banana tattoo, like a permanent tattoo on his shoulder. I'm like, that guy's a fan. So I ran up to him. I said, that game was amazing. I go, I go, who won? And he looks at me and goes, I, I don't know. And I'm like, what? You're a fan. He's like, I love the Savannah Bananas. I, I don't watch the game. I'm here for the show. He, yeah. That guy got it. The Savannah Bananas get it. Baseball is simply just a little term they put on it, but it's the Harlem Globetrotters. I, you know, what's the end of the Harlem Globetrotters game? You simply know the Harlem Globetrotters beat the Washington, whoever they – Yeah, exactly. You know, every time. <laughs> but you don't know the score. You know you're entertained. Yeah. And you know, so one of the other core message I took out of that and, and you practice this in writing your books, which is listen to your customer, ask your customer. And because if they didn't listen to that letter from Ron Howard, or you didn't listen to the, the thoughts that were coming in from your, your customers, then that's where the next idea or that's where the iteration or that's where you know, you're going to get some, you know, piece of your business and understand it better. Um, there's another interesting story uh, like you talk about, which I thought it was hilarious in this context, which was uh, you spoke to some funeral directors. <laughs> yeah, at Yankee Stadium. And, and the, the, so how did that even come about? I, 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 well, I, I guess I got a call from Funeral directors them. at Yankee Stadium. Well, so let, let me just clarify that. It wasn't like 
funeral directors filling 50,000 seats. <laughs> so it was at Yankee Stadium, but they have these training rooms. Yeah. So it's, it's a business center too there. You, right. I never really knew. It so looks. Was, it sounds better like you're on the mound and then they're just could you around imagine? you. That's what Welcome I'm, everyone, everyone, everyone to Yankee, <laughs> Yankee, Yankee Stadium. Yeah. No. That's what now, I'm picturing. Was, you know, 150, 200 funeral directors. And uh, they, you know, I, I remember, this isn't a story from the book, but I remember telling them, I said, you know, uh, the, the biggest definition of, the biggest way to find success is repeatability, right? I said, if you can get a customer buy a second time and third time, you got an engaged customer. And someone like kind of awkwardly raises his hand and says, we're funeral directors. Like there isn't much repeat in our business. <laughs> you know? And I know they all, they all do the funeral director joke, like ha, ha, ha. They have very deep voices. Very, everyone's very <laughs> solemn all the time. And uh, that's when I, when I explained, well, repetition isn't from a person that studies from a community. And um, can, can we exploit, not exploit, but can we, can we serve community so well that our reputation is of excellence? Like instead of serving anyone who passes away, can we specialize in Armenian funerals? Or can we specialize in gay couples or something like that? Or whatever it is and get a reputation of such excellence that that community will be loyal to us because we're loyal to them. Yeah. And I think you know, I was talking to someone who's got a very, very successful um, e-commerce company that sells, like, sells memorabilia for the deceased. So they have lockets and necklaces. And so there's other things basically in the book you talk about what are all the things you could be doing to serve that person that would help, you know? Um, oh yeah, yeah. We yeah. I remember uh, there was a, they teamed up with a portrait painter who would paint the portrait, but also write the story of the person within the painting. There was one really fascinating technique they did is they would do a, a traditional portrait, but they would use uh, micro editing to put a, along like the the lines and their clothing actual stories, and you wouldn't know it even mm-hmm. was there unless you had a, a magnifying glass. Wow. Yeah, it was just really an innovative way, and and people loved it. You know, it's different. Mike, you, uh, there's really a big question that I, I love that you talk about in your books, which is, and every entrepreneur probably pops in their head, how do I take four weeks off without checking email, checking with my company, having things run without me? So what are some of the first steps and talk about that concept? And my friend, Tony Ruley went to one of your you know, events and uh, actually report back. He's like, I, everyone needs this event. Everyone oh, needs I love it. So that's clock, Yeah, yes. run like clockwork. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, I believe there's two forms of, pro- significant forms of poverty in entrepreneurship. There's many forms, but there's two significant. One is uh, financial poverty. Everyone's aware of that. The bigger one, I think, is time poverty. That we become, you know, slaves is too strong of a word, but we, we become... We, 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 we devote our life to serving the business as opposed to business serving our life. Yeah. So I studied this phenomenon and I just determined that for the vast majority of businesses, if the owner, small businesses, if the owner can leave the business for four consecutive weeks, a physical and digital disconnect, and the business continues to sustain and grow, it likely can go into perpetuity because most things happen every four weeks, you know, billings, hiring, firing, new clients, old clients leaving. So the, the first step is actually schedule the four-week vacation, step one. And many people are trying to get there. They're saying, you know, one day I'll be ready for the vacation, and it never comes about. Because they just need to schedule mandated. it. Yeah, schedule it. So what I tell people, and it's not like tomorrow, like, hey, take a four-week vacation, but a year from now, maybe two years, but it's got to be booked. Hmm. And, and the goal isn't the vacation. The goal is the business has no experience with you. You've got to be gone. So I don't care if you go, you know, to your mother-in-law's house. I, actually, that, that sounds like misery. But, you know, <laughs> go, go somewhere. Hopefully she's not listening to this. Yeah, hopefully she's yeah. not listening. <laughs> go, go somewhere you're not uh, able to access the business. What happens is there's a mind shift. One of my favorite stories was uh, a gentleman named Mike Aglario. He runs a plumbing house, home service. Uh, I know company. Mike. Yeah. You know Mike? Yep. Yeah, he had Warrior. that big HVAC, the CEO Warrior, yeah? Yeah. Oh, he, a you know, they, prolific they company. company. Amazing. Yeah. $30 million, right? He, he starts out in a van, $30 million. And I asked him, I said, how do you go from being the guy who's driving around the van, repairing electrical stuff and plumbing stuff to having a $30 million company and, and, and like this? He says, well, he was driving the van for four or five years and said, this, this is not working anymore. He started asking a new question. He said, instead of asking how am I going to get this work done? He said, who is going to get this work done? Hmm. That is a defining shift. 
Hmm. So when you schedule that for your vacation, stop asking, how am I going to do this? And ask who's going to do this. And that forces you to start systematizing, bringing the resources. It doesn't mean full-time employees. It could be part-time. It could be virtual contractors. It could be empowering your vendors. It actually could be even training your customers on how to do things to bring about efficiency. Yeah. That's the two big steps. Schedule it and shift from doing to designing. I Who call. will get this done? Not how. I love that. And Mike is a force to be reckoned with. Everyone should check out CEO Warrior. Oh, it's too. an animal. I, t- I literally was talking to him. Did yesterday. you talk to his, did he have you speak at one of his events? Yeah. Yeah. It, yesterday. Okay. Okay. I, I, oh, I, I speak he, at many of his events. Got he, it. He did a virtual one yesterday. And like two minutes before I go on, I get this uh, text, you know, it has those dots. You're sitting there. It's like, oh, what, what's Mike wants? Is there a problem? And it all is the Hulk roaring. And, he, and it says, <laughs> you better bring your A game. <laughs> Um, Mike, so much to cover. I know you have to hop off in a few. Um, I love to hear, I always ask since Inspired Insider, what's been a low moment? What's been a high moment? Maybe talk about and fix this next. Um, There's a high and low story in there, like together, which is burpees. And it shocked me what, when you talk to the founder of burpees, what he was saying about his legacy living uh, on. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that was fascinating. Um, I'm so blessed. I, did, I actually got chills now, as you said. I, I was so blessed to talk to him before he passed away. He was an eccentric. I never met him face to face. I did a phone call, phone calls with him, um, but we sh- we shared a mutual friend. And I wanted to, the Burt's Bees, you know, from zero to a billion dollar exit with Clorox. Um, Burt was this eccentric beekeeper who would sell these products on the side of the street up in Maine. Um, so you can get, you know, bee lip balm and stuff like that. Well, he partnered up with a woman named Roxanne. I, I can't remember her last name at the moment, but partnered with her and they grew this business. Um, when, when they sold for a billion dollars, Bert already left the business. There was a dispute with him and his partner, Roxanne. And I asked him about the whole experience. You know, he made still some pretty good money. And I said, uh, wow, what, that's the definition of entrepreneurial success to build something and sell it. I said, uh, if you could do it all over again, um, what would you do different? And he said, I wouldn't do it again. And it, it kind of punched me in the face. And I, I was like, what do you mean? He goes, it was a horrible experience. Hmm. What came clear to me was that the entrepreneurial journey is something that we have to define for ourselves. Success is not bigger is better. It's, it's that it satisfies an inner thirst that needs to be quenched. His thirst his thirst was just to be happy. Hmm. Bert, my interpretation was he just, he just wanted to, uh, to give to his community. He just wanted to live a very humble life. When, you know, when he made his millions, whatever Roxanne bought it out for, he, he didn't move to a new cabin. He's still in a cabin in the woods. He never had a cell phone. I had to call, I had to call the local convenience, the general store, and you say, hey, is Bert around right now? Nah, we don't see him. <laughs> that's, how you, that's how you got hold of this guy after yeah. he had built Bert's Bees. He, he wouldn't have done it again. Yeah. I, the definition and why I, I had that story in there is that legacy is something of our choosing. We have to, we have the right and we must define what we want for ourselves and have our business satisfy our want. It's not about just money. Yeah. Everyone go to fixthisnext.com. Check out all of his books, Profit First, Clockwork, Surge, The Pumpkin Plan, The Toilet Paper Muncher, but fix this next. Start with fix this next, according to Mike. So Mike, <laughs> yeah, dude. thank you so much. I totally appreciate your time. Like a peach if you find the same right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand